Hi, everybody. I uh, hope your breakout rooms went well. Yeah. 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 Great. OK. So, uh, Dan, are you ready to kick off? Yeah. Yeah. OK, super. So what we'll do is we'll put everybody else on mute. And if you have any questions, Marie and I will be keeping an eye on the um, hand raising. <laughs> so over okay. to you, Dan. Let to start then. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I obviously the, the portal opened on Monday, which I'm sure you're probably all aware of. Uh, so I don't know. If, I know that Graham and James have both had a go at kind of going through the portal. I don't know if the rest of you have, but. I'm going to kind of go through furlough kind of from this starting point and work through up to getting the information on the portal and what information you need for that. Um, so, I mean, apologies if some of it is information you already know, um, but I thought it might just to go through it from the start is probably beneficial. Um, so kind of just as an overview of the scheme. Um, so this furlough scheme is open to all employers that have had a PAYE scheme um, at the 19th of March 2020 and that have a UK bank account. Um, the furlough scheme is going to be, at the moment, the government is saying it's going to be operating for four months, so running from the 1st of March through to the 30th of June, although I suspect eventually that will be extended, but at the moment it's running until the 30th of June. Um, so kind of a bit of detail on if you're going to furlough an employee, um, that employee isn't allowed to do any work for the company at all. Um, in terms of actual employees, they're allowed to do training, but that is that is it. Employees aren't allowed to do any work for the company, which could be seen to generate any revenue. Um, directors can furlough themselves as long as they were on the payroll, as at the 28th of February. Um, in that instance, it's a little more relaxed in the sense that directors are allowed to do anything that's considered a statutory obligation. So, for instance, if you had an obligation that something's got to be filed at company's house, that would be seen as a statutory obligation. As a director, you would be allowed to do that. But still, the same as employees, you aren't allowed to do any work that can be seen to generate revenue for the business. Um, any employee that's going to be put on furlough um, has to be written to and it has to be formally agreed with that employee in writing that they are going to be furloughed. Um, the minimum furlough period at the moment is three weeks. Um, you are allowed to rotate your employees. So if you had 10 employees and you want to furlough five of them, you could have them on a rotation basis. So you furloughed five for three weeks and then you furloughed a different five for the next three weeks, if that's the way you wanted to work it. But the minimum furlough period for one employee at any one time must be three weeks. You can't furlough somebody for one week furlough a different employee the next week. One employee has to be furloughed for a three week period. Um, any furloughed employees, probably fairly obvious, but they have all the same rights as your non furloughed employees. So they still have sick pay, still have maternity rights. Um, in terms of the numbers of the scheme, HMRC, as you're probably aware, will pay um, 80 percent of the employee salary up to a max up of the employee's gross salary up to a maximum of two and a half thousand um, as an employer you have the option to top that up to the full hundred percent but there's no obligation to top it up to the full hundred percent um, if you are not going to top it up to the full hundred percent then there needs to be a variation in that employee's contract so it just needs to be con confirmed contractually that they are not going to be receiving the full 100% for that period that they're furloughed. Um, HMRC is saying they reserve the right to audit any of these claims that are going in. I mean, the last I'd heard, as of the end of Monday, they'd had 140,000 claims. So they're not, there's no way they're going to be auditing all of those before they're paying money out. But it's just kind of to make you aware that you need to keep all of your supporting documentation and everything because they could come back at a later date and ask to see support for that claim that you put in. Again, on the basis of the volume of the claims that are going to go in, I'd say it's very unlikely that they're actually going to come back and ask to see the documentation, but you just need to make sure you've got it. Um, in terms of who can be furloughed, so it's any employee 
that was on the payroll on or before the 19th of March. Um, and who this is the possible tricky bit, and, and they, also, they also say, and who were notified to HMRC on an RTI submission. So where this potentially catches people that I've seen so far is that if, you, um, if you'd employed somebody since the 28th of February, you might have seen bits where there's, there's been employees that, employees that had changed jobs and they'd started a new job on, say, the 5th of March, and originally when the government issued guidance, they wouldn't qualify to be furloughed from their new company because they'd missed that 28th of February deadline. So the government extended it to the 19th of March to try and pick up as many of those people as they could so they could be furloughed. But the issue that I've seen is that when you do an RTI submission, it is generally at the time you submit your payroll for the month. So somebody that's been employed between the 1st of March and the 19th of March, a lot of employers won't have put in an RTI submission at that date because the last one they would have done would have been at the 28th of February. So I don't know if anyone has got any employees that are employed between the 1st of March and the 19th of March. If they have, it might be a separate discussion we need to have. If nobody has, then it's not an issue because when you submitted your February, when you submitted your February payroll, you'd have put an RTI submission in. We we have we took somebody on on the 2nd of March and we pay them monthly. Okay. So. So, do you know? Have you? Like I said, you tend to do the RTI submission when you submit your, the, the payroll at the end of each month, the RTI submission goes in. So I'm assuming that a separate RTI submission probably hasn't gone in between the... I, the I don't know. I'd, I'd have to check. I had, I had kind of heard this. I mean, at the moment, we said we'll pay him anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I... Yeah, I, mean, I think it's one of those things that obviously they're trying to do the best they can by everyone and there's going to be little kind of... There's going to be little yeah. loopholes and there's going to be people that fall between the gaps. But so it might be that for this month, like you say, perhaps it, you can't. And then once you've submitted the March payroll going forwards. All right. So if we if we paid him for March, then we could potentially. Um, we well, have to. So the RTI submission has to have gone in before the 19th of March. So if it hasn't gone in before the 19th of March. That has been missed. Right. Well, we, we would have paid him at the end of March. Because he started on the 2nd. So we would have paid him at the end of March. Okay. Okay. So you'll be, so you should be. Yeah, but it depends. So if that R, if you paid him at the end of March, the RTI submission will have gone in after the 19th of March? Yes. So that's where you could potentially fall in the gap. So does that mean we'll never be able to furlough him or we can from now, say? I understand it as, as, as from now, based on the guidance that I've seen. But again, that, I think that might be worth something that perhaps just confirming with kind of the HMRC chat that you can do online. Right. Um, that was, that's one kind of gap that I've seen that could be a potential. A potential. Okay. Thing. But I say, I mean, it comes back to the fact that you can do it and claim it, but if they come back and audit you and say, you know that particular employee then you're yeah then you're caught so it's kind of because to be honest he well he, he's, he's an apprentice and we just have sent him home and said do training but from what yeah. you're saying that's that's yeah. fine anyway so it's yeah. almost like well we may as well furlough him yes because he fits all the rules yes he can't do anything else to be fair okay <laughs> <laughs> that probably suits him then <laughs> yeah he can, he can come back. He come back fully trained. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> he crack straight on with the job. Yeah, it might be worth something just double checking that. Like okay, I said, I'll have H a look. Yeah, the HMRC, HMRC chat, but that is one kind of gap that people could fall into. Um, there's they have said that so employees that were made redundant on or on or after the twenty eighth of February can be rehired and put on furlough, even if the uh, employment recommencement date is after the 19th of March. So if anybody was made redundant before all of this was announced, and subsequently you've decided that you want to re-employ that person, you're going to furlough them, then that is allowed. So I don't know if that, that has affected anybody, um, but you can furlough people that you'd previously made redundant. Um, 
So it, you can furlough any employees that are on full-time, part-time, agency, flexible or zero-hour contracts. Um, so any employees that were placed on unpaid leave after the 28th of February can be furloughed. Any employees that were put on unpaid leave before the 28th of February unfortunately can't be furloughed until after the date that it was agreed they would come back. So for instance, if somebody was put on unpaid leave on the 20th of February and you'd agreed with them that they would come back um, on the 20th of May, for example, you couldn't furlough that person until after the 20th of May. But if they were put on unpaid leave after the 28th of February, after that cutoff date, then they could still be put on furlough. Um, in terms of who can't be put on furlough, you've got any employees that are working reduced hours or working simply for reduced pay which is pretty self-explanatory because as we went through with the rules before, if they're doing any work that can generate revenue, then you can't furlough them. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, any new employees that were hired after the 19th of March, so anybody that hadn't previously worked for you and been made redundant, but an employee that was just new and hired after the 19th of March, unfortunately they can't be furloughed. Um, Anyone self-employed who isn't paid through PAYE? Oh, I don't think Graham can hear. He was... Okay, I'll talk to Graham on the chat outside of this. Yeah. Carry on. I can, we can, I can hear you, so hopefully everyone else okay. can. <laughs> yeah, so... Yes, yeah, so anyone that's self-employed who isn't paid through your PAYE scheme can't be furloughed. Um, so any employees that, that were on sick leave as at the 28th of February can't be furloughed until they return from sick leave. Um, in terms of how the 80% is calculated, um, as I said, it's 80% it's up to a maximum of 2,500 that you can claim, plus um, any associated employers and I on that amount and any um, minimum up to auto enrolment level pension contributions. So obviously you've got 3% pension contributions, so you can reclaim your 3% auto enrolment level pension contributions uh, on your furlough claim. Any additional employer's pension above that 3% can't be claimed. Um, if it's an employee on a fixed term contract, it's obviously it's simpler because that's your, you've taken the fixed amount, you've taken the fixed gross amount and you're saying it's the, it's, it's the lower of two and a half thousand and what they're, they're paid. If you've got employees that are on a variable, a variable wage, they're not paid a fixed wage each month, then your options are you can take the higher of the same month's earnings for the previous year and the average monthly salary for the 1920 tax year. So they are two options if you've got variable pay. Um, this next bit has caused a bit of confusion because I've seen in some places that people are saying that you can't claim for commission payments. Um, the actual guidance, if you look on the HMRC website, says that as part of your claim, you can claim for any commission that is non-discretionary. So that basically means if in their terms of contract you've got that they're entitled to 10% commission, then as part of your calculation above where you're taking the higher of their same month and their previous year's average, you can claim the commission amount in that if it's contractual. If it isn't contractual, then unfortunately you can't claim that as part of your claim. It would just be on their, their, their net, their sort of standard basic gross salaried amount that you can actually claim. Um, so it comes back to, is it contractual basically on that point? Um, in terms of, I've seen there's been some issues when talking about national minimum wage. Um, if you've, you've got an employee that for instance is on national minimum wage and you're furloughing them, and you're paying them 80% of a national minimum wage, that doesn't cause you a problem. You're not in breach of anything for paying them 80% of national minimum wage because you're still applying that same principle. So if you furlough someone on national minimum wage, or if you furlough somebody 
and because you're applying 80% it takes them below national minimum wage that that is correct and that isn't an issue where it comes in um, into effect and there is an issue is where if they're doing it if they are doing any training for you when they're furloughed you'll have to pay them the hourly rate for that training that they're doing because technically they are doing some work of some description um, and you shouldn't be paying them below national minimum wage that's kind of like again another area you just need to be aware of that if they are doing any training and the 80% is taken below national minimum wage you do have to pay them the additional amount for the hours that they do um, and in terms of the calculation date when you're calculating it it should be you should be doing that calculation from the date they were furloughed up to the end date of them being furloughed. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing it from the date that you told them they were furloughed. So for instance, if you told an employee on the Monday, we're going to be furloughing you as of next Monday, you have to do it from the date they actually started on furlough and they weren't working for you. Um, in terms of the kind of logistics of making the claim, like I said, I know I've spoken to James and he's done this yesterday and had some fun with it. And Graham has been trying to do it. Um, but there's an online portal that opened on Monday um, where you kind of you plug all of the information in. So for, for that, you'll need to be registered for PAY, PAYE online. Um, and when you register for PAYE online, you get sent a government gateway ID and a password. So to log into the portal, you need your government ID and password to get into that portal. Um, you'll need to have at hand your UK bank number and sort code because they'll need to know that to know where they're, they're paying the money, paying the money into. You need to have your employer's PAYE reference number. You need to have details of the number of employees that you're furloughing. Um, you have to have each employee's NI number. You'll have to have the start and the end date for each employee that you're putting on furlough. Um, and you'll have to have the details of the amount being claimed, including the NI and the minimum pension contributions. And then they'll, they'll also ask for uh, your contact name and number, so they know who to contact for the claim. Um, I said, as some people have found, unfortunately, they've set, they've set a limit of 100 employees for being able to do this automatically. So if you've got over 100 employees, you're able to upload like an Excel document into the system and they take all the, they extract all the data out. If you're furloughing less than 100 employees, unfortunately, you have to go through manually and enter all of the details in for each employee, which, you know, for companies, small companies, on the majority of cases, it's going to be below 100. So, for instance, if you do have 50 employees you're putting on furlough, it is going to be, it's going to be quite time intensive doing that. Um, why they set it at 100, I don't know, because that seems... That does seem very high. If they'd set it at 10 or something and you could just upload anything above that, it would make it a lot quicker and simpler. But unfortunately, that is it. Um, so if you use an agent to do your payroll and they're authorised with HMRC to act on your behalf for payroll, they can do that claim for you. If they haven't got agent authorisation, um, you will have to do that yourselves. Um, I know from when I worked at, at an accountancy practice, we'd occasionally get the odd one where HMRC would say, well, you're, you're registered to do their payroll, but you haven't got the additional agent authorization to, um, to actually speak to HMRC on their behalf. And that's where you get a problem where you sometimes get companies that have outside agents doing their payroll. If they're not authorized to do some of the extra stuff, they then can't actually go through and do these claims and some of the other bits. That's something just to check. Um, so after it's been claimed, you should get given a reference number. Um, I've seen that apparently they don't send out a confirmation email that you've uploaded it. So you just need to be wary that when, that, when you've done that claim and you get a reference number just to print it or take a screenshot or something just that you've got it, um, just in case, because I have been told that they're not sending emails. That it might be that they do, but I've been told that they don't at this stage. Um, they're saying that they should be paying any claims within six days, um, so it should be a fairly a fairly quick turnaround. So any claim that goes in 
sort of but today for example hopefully you should have the money um sort of in time before you're kind of before you actually pay your employees so hopefully that should sort of minimize any cash flow any cash flow effect um if you do have to pay employees before that obviously you just need to bear in mind um well james has just said six working days um so yeah any any claim so any claim that goes in today um yeah you need to exclude saturday and sunday so it could be that it could be so you say wednesday thursday friday it might be next wednesday possibly next thursday by the time you get paid it so you just need to bear that in mind in terms of in terms of your cash flow expectations um yeah like i said before just it's important just to keep keep copies of any records and calculations that you've got just in case the hmrc do come back um and ask to see any supporting supporting documentation for your claim mm -hmm. um that's kind of it in terms of what i've got so if anybody's got any questions on it then do let me know like i said i can give you all my email address as well so if when you come through to actually do it and you encounter any issues i can come back to you on that but if there's any specific questions at the moment then please do let me know okay let me just unmute you one sec hello hey. for it um how does how does it work in terms of maternity leave so I've got a member of staff who's due to go on maternity leave around about the 13th of June. Mm -hmm. um, she's currently still working, um, but she's also talking about taking some, she wants to take some holiday before her maternity leave starts. Mm -hmm. um, is that something, because really I probably don't need her working for potentially past the end of next week. So I was planning on furloughing her. Mm -hmm. but um but is that something that we can do or not um i would need i would need to go back and double check and, and double check the hmrc guidance on it um i haven't been i haven't seen that as kind of as a specific as a specific issue at the moment um james james yeah, I, I think if well normal rules apply to statutory maternity pay so you still pay her the smp but that's part of her gross pay so you claim it back in the furlough claim mm -hmm. did you hear that? that yeah that would yeah that that would make sense but i would just want to i'll just double check it i can just double check it on the on the hmrc guidance just well, to, that's what I've done with my uh, employee on SMP. Okay. You were breaking off a bit there, James. Yeah, I've got one employee on SMP. Yeah. And uh, that's how I've done it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Helen had a question as well. If that's if that's fully answered now. So in one sec, I'll just unmute you, Helen. Okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering, Dan, we had a number, our drivers, we can't work. They've all had to go on furlough. We're a removal company mm -hmm. and they've all had to go on furlough um, mm -hmm. because we can't keep the social distancing of uh, two metres and carry yes. furniture. Um, however, they, uh, bless them, they, they stepped forward and volunteered because we do a lot of work with the NHS normally and mm -hmm. uh, they needed rooms cleared to make space for more beds. Mm -hmm. um, we're not charging the NHS for the, the guy's time and that we asked, they've all been furloughed, but we said, can anyone volunteer to do this work? Presumably that's not going to come, have any impact on their no, furlough. They, no, they do, they do say that you are allowed to do volunteer work. Employees are allowed to do volunteer work in their time. Right. Um, it kind of it comes back to that point of really is it can it be seen as generating revenue for the company? Which if it's volunteer work, it isn't. Right. We may charge we may charge the NHS for the use of our vehicles because we had to use the vans. But again, it would be at cost. It wouldn't be. Um, it, it wasn't going to be. Um, we're not making any money, but we can't afford to just give them the vehicles, you know, and the fuel, yeah. etc. Yeah, well, the the, guide, the guidance is that employees are allowed to do volunteer volunteer work. Fair so enough. Where's I, furlough? I think you, you can just you can justify that. I think. Right. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, any other questions? If not, what I think we'll do is go into breakout rooms again for maybe 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Hello, again. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome back. Okay. So I hope that's been a really helpful for everyone. Um, as was mentioned, I think at the beginning, this is our first time doing these. So we would really welcome any feedback that you have. So if you've got any feedback or suggestions or topics that you'd like to see covered in this kind of format, you can email us mail at isbar.co.uk. That would be really great. Uh, Mike, I can see you've got your hand raised. Do you have a question? Let me just unmute you. Unmute. I just wanted to mention that if anybody uh, knows anybody that's looking for some extra cash at the moment, then um, maybe uh, we could just have a quick chat and they could have a look and see whether what we do is uh, right for them. What do you do? I do. We do a uh, utility warehouse. All right. Yeah, anybody who's not a utility warehouse, you must be nuts. You... you... <laughs> If you're not a customer of a utility warehouse, you must be nuts. <laughs> well, I'd say so. <laughs> I okay, know a lot so of you, you are, so that's great. But um, great. this is obviously, you know, there are people looking for extra cash working from mm. home. And uh, it takes 20 minutes to run through what we do. And then people can ask whatever questions they like and uh, see if it's for them. Yeah, and Helen had just asked in the chat how you can get in touch with people who came today. So, Marie, you circulated a list of attendees, I think, yesterday. Will that have gone to everyone? It should have gone to everybody that, yeah, because I don't think there were any more bookings since I sent the list out. But if for okay. any reason anyone didn't get it, just get in touch on mail at isbar.co.uk and I can resend it. But right. it had email and email addresses and phone numbers on it, so... Okay, and the other thing that I wanted to mention as well is that, as you're probably aware, we've had to move ABE because of the current situation. ISVA are in the process of planning a virtual business summit to happen on the day that we were going to be having ABE. So that's going to be all online and it's going to be useful talks from businesses around the area about um, anything to help you in the current situation. Um, so we're in the very early stages, but if you keep an eye on the ISBAR social media, we'll be making announcements about that soon. Um, and it'll be on yeah, the 13th of May. So that's quite exciting. We're excited anyway. Very, yeah. And can I just remind people as well that the actual physical exhibition will now be on the 8th of September. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you've not signed up or anything or you want to come along, then that's when it'll be. Yeah. So two, two key dates for your diary. <laughs> Super. So that's almost 11 o'clock on the nose. I think that's pretty that's good timekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> well done, everyone. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, tell your friends. <laughs> Thank you for organising this. It's been really useful. Thank you. Great. And we will be sharing the video um, shortly. So we need to do a little bit of editing on it, but we will be sharing it shortly so that people who weren't able to come can also hear from Dan's words of wisdom. And so, just um, to say that we'll be back in two weeks' time, won't we, Ruth, on another yeah. virtual networking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Girl. Chris, did you I'm want to say nice something? To see you, Glynis. Glad you could join us. Yeah, nice to see people. It's lovely this. I've I met somebody <laughs> from Leicester yesterday who was like, "Hello, we've spoken on LinkedIn." And yeah, hello. Yeah, this is what I look like. Yeah, I mean, from down. Obviously, I'm only dressed like this to the waist, and then I've got my pajamas on. Somebody gave me a really good tip this morning. He said, "What he does." is when he's working, he puts shoes on. And mm. that means he puts his head into sh into work mode. And then when he's finished work, he puts his slippers on. So mm. I just share that with you as something I learned this morning that I will look at. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Chris, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say it was, um, you know, obviously it's disappointing not to be able to have our, our usual sort of meet the members, but it's nice to see people have, have been able to get along here today that, 
may not have necessarily been able to get to a, a live one. So um, thank you for yeah. coming and uh, hopefully um, you know, we can have have more of these events while we're not able to go into the physical world. Mm -hmm. It may well be that even when we go back in the physical world, Chris, we can still have the virtual one for the people that cannot attend. That yeah, may be yeah, an idea to yes, go forward. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone. And um, watch you. this space for the Thank recording. You. Thanks very Thank much. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.